Hi, this is Bethany from Dallas, Texas, and you're listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Hey everyone, this is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics. I'm on in this segment with Lori Birch, who is running for Congress from the 3rd District in Texas. Hi, Lori. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining me. Could you start by telling us just a little bit about your background and why you're running for Congress? Sure, definitely. The 3rd District of Texas is the North Texas suburban area, and it's actually my my home. I wasn't born and raised here, but a joke that we have here is I got in Texas as I got here as quick as I could. I started high school in the Plano area in 10th grade, and I had just moved from Indonesia. My dad worked for Mobile Oil, and we lived over there for two years, and I got to go to an international school, which is just a phenomenal experience. And plopped down in Plano and went to high school here. Had always really wanted to be involved in leadership and activism, just really speaking up for people who don't feel seen or heard or represented and just trying to create more equal opportunities and equal access to justice. Just ingrained in me. And so I went to college in San Antonio and spent a semester in D.C., and got the D.C. bug and decided that that's where I wanted to go to law school. And when I was in the special semester, I um, had an internship with the as an investigator with the Public Defender Service. And that was really uh, an eye opening experience, particularly in regards to the criminal justice system. And when I was in law school at George Washington in D.C., I got a lot of different great exposure to uh, nonprofits and to uh, civil rights organizations. I had fellowships with the Human Rights Campaign and People for the American Way. And then even after law school ended up in a contractual position with the Securities and Exchange Commission. So I really got to see a wide variety of how things work and decided that I missed my family and wanted to come back home to the uh, North Texas area and start my own law practice. And so I'd seen my mom successfully build two different businesses here in the local community. And I followed in her footsteps as far as going out to chambers of commerce and going to local business associations. One in particular I got very involved with was the American Business Women's Association. Association. And through building my practice and, and building up leadership and taking on leadership roles, the American Business Women's Association in particular was one that I was asked to pursue national leadership on the national board. And so I ran for um, the first position and got elected and ran for national vice president, got elected, and then actually ran for national president and had the honor of being elected and serving in that role from 2013 to 2014. And during that whole arc of just seeing, you know, through leadership and advocacy and then seeing our community here, how it looked in the early 90s when we first moved here and just how it's grown and developed, but also become so much more diverse. Our politics have become so much more divided. And I never really saw myself running for office, but I joke that it's kind of a coming out story now that I am. I kind of always knew I would. (laughs) But uh, I just I felt that in this current political climate, I have a passion and and even a skill set from what I have experienced and really just being able to bring people from different perspectives, come to the leadership table, let's find some common ground, let's collaborate and and get things done for people. And like so many of the people I talk to, I'm just tired of. Uh, politicians are so-called leaders who sell us out to their big donors and don't really try and listen to the people that they are representing and, and bridge those divides and, and bring people together. And so I decided, well, if that's, uh, if that's what my calling is, that's what my calling is. So maybe I should run for office. So here I am. Great. And you have a campaign video called, I think it's called We the People and, and, You have a lot of different people talking about who they are and that they are the people. Can you talk a little bit about that, that video and that idea, how that, how that drives your campaign? Oh, there's nothing better than I would like to talk about that (laughs) because we call it, we are the people. And it was actually an idea that, that I had in late December of one, just we hear so much lip service and even these, these um, sound bites of, you know, we, the people and this and that. And do we really even think about who is that? <laughs> what does that even mean? 
And that video came together in such a special way because not only did we have all of those people that were in the video uh, li actually live in our district, but they're also involved with the campaign. They just had organically been drawn to volunteer and be engaged because they want to see that same message. And the message in that video and what, you know, the, the message of this campaign is that our community and our country doesn't belong to one race or religion or sex or socioeconomic class or to Republicans or Democrats. It belongs to all of us. And while we may not always agree that we have to embrace and we must embrace that our future is inextricably connected to the well-being of one another. And I wanted to really be able to shed light on the faces of our community. And when we have elected leaders that don't see the people, they can't represent the people. And that's the heart of my campaign, the heart of my message. And I love that you asked me about that because that video, I, I believe, really represents me and the campaign, but, but even probably more importantly, really represents the community and our district. What are some of those issues as you're talking to people, as you're really trying to, to see them and hear them and represent them? What are the kind of issues that they're facing that they need champions in Congress to help them with? I think it's really interesting because we see play out on the national media and, and the local stage, even these, these huge policy issues. We still haven't been able to resolve health care in a meaningful way for, for uh, working families. We still uh, you know, debate this immigration, uh, criminal justice reform, climate change. I mean, these are all major, major policy issues that we need to address. But the most fundamental thing that I hear consistently, no matter what side of the political spectrum people fall on, is they are back to this fundamental issue foundationally that our, our system is broken. The system is broken because we don't have leaders that are seeking to bring people together that are truly accountable to the people who are in their districts. And, and so what we've seen over, and even in uh, our area, which is fairly affluent, but there's still lots of struggles there. We see that the, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poor and the middle class is shrinking. Millennials are the first generation to make less than the one before them. In our particular area, our corporations and small businesses are like are suffering from the inability to get any sort of immigration reform done. And at the same time, our voter turnout is, the is some of the lowest in the country, from either 47 to 49th in the country. And we've seen different statistics, but either way, that's bad. People do not feel engaged and they don't trust their leadership. And one of the things that I've taken a very strong stand on is that I am not taking any donations from PACs, political action committees, or special interest groups, even ones that have endorsed me, even ones that I've worked for. We've taken a hard line on that. And I'll tell you that that is the most consistent issue that I hear is people want to have a restored sense of trust in their leaders that they are going to listen to them and that they are going to be transparent and accountable to them. And then really, until we fix that process, that foundation, I don't believe we're really going to be able to tackle the main policy issues that are, are that, that's touching every segment of our country and our community. But we've got to change who gets elected and how they get elected. And that's that's the heart of why I am running. So I know you're not running specifically on partisan politics, but you are the Democratic nominee for the district. And this is a district that hasn't been represented by a Democrat since 1968 has voted consistently for Republicans in presidential elections. So what do you see as your, your path to victory, your, your ability to win in a district like this? What does that look like? And, and what are you hearing on the ground that, that gives you confidence that that's possible? Yeah, that's a great question. It gets back to one of the things I just mentioned, and that is voter turnout. So when people talk about Texas and then specifically this district, that it's all this way. It's all red or it's so conservative. I, I, I have jokingly say, well, only the people who are voting are. <laughs> and, it, you know, and, and, but there's truth behind that. And there's data behind that. More importantly, is when we look at, at our targeting and who we're going after is not just, you know, the small base of people that are more in line uh, with, with the Democratic Party, but truly people who feel disengaged at best or disgusted at worst with our current political system. And that is an opportunity for people like me who aren't, yes, I'm a de the Democratic nominee, 
but there's something so much more fundamental. As I'm a member of this community and I'm someone who has a heart and a passion, but more importantly, the experience in being able to see different points of view and finding common ground and common solutions. And it's surprising that when you can take those labels off of things, that we really can find a lot of common ground and talk about strategies for moving forward. So I think that, and I've tried to get people in our area to stop saying, well, Texas or uh, Collin County is so red or so conservative, because I, I believe that that's actually a form of not only voter suppression, but it's also a form of candidate suppression. So I've been a calling county voter my whole life. I know what the ballots look like. There aren't choices there. And, and that's a problem, whether you're a Republican, Democrat, or independent, that is a problem when you don't have choices. And that suppresses the vote, but it also makes people feel like, well, why bother running? You know, how am I going to win? It's part of this good old boy system, and it's only one perspective and one type of person that's going to win. Well, this year, we've seen a huge swing in having more and more candidates. So for us in Collin County and really throughout the country, you're seeing those choices. You're seeing more candidates run. So we've taken care of the no choices problem. Now it's time to take to get that message to the people, to the to the non-voters, uh, the non-registered voters, and to the voters alike that there are choices this year. Find out about them, meet them, and most importantly, get out there and vote. You mentioned that you're not taking PAC money, and not surprisingly, you don't have as much money, fundraising money, as the Republican incumbent. Every Republican incumbent I've looked at across the country has a ton of money. Sure. How do you how do you bridge that money gap? What what are the ways that you can campaign that don't rely as heavily on having those big dollars to spend? Yeah, it's easy. It's easy because you don't need money. I mean, you need some money, but you don't need to raise the most money. Let me rephrase it that way. You don't need to raise the most money. You need to get the most votes. And when we talk about a grassroots campaign, it is about getting out to the voters. We have handwritten postcards. We have block walking every single day. We have phone bankings constantly. We go to events where, community events, where from wine walks to family expos, where we don't see any other candidates there. We're trying to reach out to the community as a whole. And I'm very, I'm, I'm very, very focused on back to what I said, until we change the people elected, until we change how they're elected, we're not going to get to to see these long-term policy changes. And so I'm actually very, very much by design, not trying to outraise my opponent. I want to be able to model a successful campaign so that other people from, from all segments of the community, all walks of life, all different perspectives are able to say, well, maybe I can win too. If, if I can, you know, because it's not just about money. I'm sitting here in my law office right now. I still run a full-time business, a full-time practice. I'm not someone who just can quit. And we're, this is what takes care of my family. And it's hard to juggle and balance, but that's what we need. We need more people who truly are of the community at the leadership table. And so the path forward is just, we, we've been so... Um, amazed at the the people who have come out and who have volunteered for the campaign. And actually, back to this is the, the last thing I'll do to illustrate this and, and bring it home. Is you talk about that video, which was was barely well put together. There, that didn't cost us a dime. The location, which is a brewery in McKinney, Texas, in our area, was they donated the space. All those individuals came and volunteered their time. The production crew, the editing crew, the everybody volunteered their time. And so that's what I mean. When you have a message that people believe in and that they want to see, you get the people out. You don't need to overpower them with money because that's not a path forward for us. That's not going to see the change that we truly want to see in this country and our community. So I have to ask about Elvis. <laughs> yeah, awesome. <laughs> uh, you mentioned on your website, uh, and I've seen on your Facebook feed as well, that you're a very big Elvis fan. So can you talk a little bit about yes. about that and, and why you're such a big Elvis fan? Well, there's truly nothing I'd like to talk about more. No, I, I am a huge Elvis fan. When people find out, they'll ask me uh, foolishly, so do you have an Elvis room at home? And, are, and I always say, are you kidding? <laughs> Elvis is everywhere in every corner of my room, every corner of, of my office. I, I'm a huge Elvis fan. I love his music. I love his story. It's such an American story of being able to 
be born dirt poor, but be able just to persevere and get through. But, uh, you know, the thing that I really 